Welcome everybody, my name is Tim Sandy. I'm a Cohesity Systems Engineer. In this video, I'm going to just do a quick kind of 100 level overview of the Cohesity interface. This happens to be our 6.4.1 version and there will be a newer version coming out soon. But I just wanted to do a very quick overview of this for our partners. And so bear with me, I'm not going to be covering a lot in the interface. I'm just be covering the core topics in order to have this video stay under 15, 20 minutes. So without further ado, here is our 6.4.1 interface. It is all HTML5. And if you have any type of automation solution, you can use APIs and call our APIs to automate anything that we do in our interface here. So at the top, we have a global search. This is much like much like a Google search engine where I can search for files or VM names and it'll list everywhere that that file is located, including in your snapshots. Here we see that this is the Cohesity-01 cluster. If I'm connected to other remote clusters, I would be have a little drop down here and would be able to select any one and be able to manage them all from the single interface. Here is kind of our settings. Under targets, we can connect to those remote clusters that I was talking about once we set them up here. Then we would have that drop down to be able to switch between to manage them. External targets here, these are again external. So we're going to see based upon uh, whether we're looking to archive data or tier it. There is a difference between when you select archive and tiering as to what your options are here. But we natively integrate because we are a cloud native distributed file system. We natively integrate with these cloud providers providers without the use of a cloud gateway. And as you can see for AWS, we have all the different S3 bucket types. Azure has their blob types. We have GCP, we have Oracle Cloud, generic NAS. We also uh, use QSTAR to integrate with any tape solutions, as well as S3 compatible type cloud providers, because there's some ones out there that provide generic S3 compatible storage, much like Amazon Glacier or, again, the Azure blobs. So those are where we would connect to our external targets. Next, we have the help here uh, at any particular part of the interface that you're in. If you click on the help, it will take you to that particular information associated with that page that you're in at the time. This is Helios. We can connect up to Helios uh, for organizations, especially that have multiple clusters, maybe even across the world, uh, have a lot of clusters. Helios is basically the SaaS version of this interface we're looking at, plus I add some additional capabilities. There's a free version as well as a paid. So you can connect all your clusters to this, and then you can go log into the Helios SaaS solution. Uh, the interface will be almost identical identical with a few exceptions and you could manage clusters all over the world from a single user interface. This will notify you with any uh, success or failure jobs and this is associated to the account. Going back to the settings here, we talked about remote clusters and external target. Here we have all the generic information. So uh, generic information under summary for the cluster. Access management here, this is where we would connect to, for example, Active Directory. So as you'll see here in this demo environment, we're connected to this talabs.local uh, domain name, uh, Active Directory domain. Once we connect it to that, we use role-based access control or RBAC. And so we can be very granular and detailed in setting up different roles and access to functions. So for example, DBAs can only do backups and restores of databases only, not VMs or file data, or maybe the help desk can restore a file for an end user to its original location, but can't download the file, can't do any backups or anything like that. So we can get very, very granular on that. We have some networking options. You can set up SNMP for notifications if you use something like SolarWinds or what have you. But I wanted to show you this upgrade. Our upgrade process is a non-disruptive upgrade process. What it does is it basically upgrades a node at a time in a rolling fashion. It'll do one node once it's complete and that node is fully back up in line and upgraded. It will then roll to the next one. So non-disruptive, which means that you can do it in the middle of the production day while you're running backups, doing restores, anything like that. It will do it because again, we are a hyper-converged technology. So we're able to, with the multiple nodes, with hyper-converged technology, we can upgrade a node at a time without disrupting anything. So on the left-hand side here, we have the navigation pane. Click on dashboards. This is what you initially come into. We have several different dashboards. So this is the summary one, gives you generic. Again, this is a test environment, so the data is not too interesting to look at. We have the summary which you're in. We also have a data protection specific dashboard as well as file services. 
a cloud-based one. And then also if you're using our physical agent for SQL services, there's also a SQL dashboard. Starting off, just to show you under data protection here, we can connect to different sources. In this test environment here, we are already connected to uh, two physical servers as well as a vCenter server. If you want to add sources, you simply click on this plus sign, connect to a hypervisor, a physical server. The one exception here, these sources are generally within the network. We already covered external targets external sources. This is the one exception. This is external, obviously, Office 365, which is hosted in Azure. But then we can also connect to SQL and Oracle databases, generic storage arrays, NAS. Uh, we have integrations with storage snapshot providers, certain vendors, as well as we integrate with Active Directory, and we can back up the entire Active Directory, which is a very cool feature. And we can do object level restores of Active Directory objects, providing you have the Active Directory recycling bin turned on. And then for use with the databases, physical servers themselves, if you're backing up a physical server as well as Active Directory, you're going to use our Cohesity agent for that. You have to do it for Active Directory and for physical servers. For SQL, you don't have to, but in order to get a deeper, more granular capability of uh, protecting and recovering those databases, uh, it is best practice to use the agent. It makes it a lot easier for you. So very simple to add sources. Next, I'm gonna to go to policies. Policies come, these ones already created out of the box, but you can create one very simply. I'm gonna call this test, I give it a name. I can set up uh, my retention. So one day, every one day for 14 days, I can also do uh, long-term archiving. So I can click on archiving to add that here. If I had an external, target, it would be listed here. Or if I wanted to register one now, I could register that and set up long-term archiving, say like to an AWS S3 bucket. So I do my immediate dailies for 14 days or 30 days, and then I could set up uh, archiving for say my monthlies and my annuals out to a AWS Glacier bucket for long-term archive as an example. I'm going to go ahead and cancel that. Uh, you have your retries here. You're also going to see that you can do extended retention, which is what I just talked about. Your retry, which is already there. I can replicate to another cluster. I can do periodic fulls if you need to. Bare metal recover you, using Christy to integrate with us. Again, I can archive to the cloud. I can schedule blackout windows for database purposes. I can back up the logs as a part of this policy, as well as I can do cloud spin, which is basically taking a copy of a VM and copying it out to say AWS, converting it to an AMI image to use for disaster recovery type situations. So that's how it is, easy it is to create a policy. You can have as many as you want. You can set up multiple policies with different settings for either long-term archive to cloud to replicate to another cluster, maybe do cloud spin. Again, you can make it very granular to your needs and how your organization does that. So that's policy. So then next what you do is create a protection job. We already have some protection jobs in here. Just to show you real quick how to do a protection job, I'm gonna protect a virtual server. I'm gonna register my source, with, which in this case is a vCenter server. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna look at it by folder in vCenter. So let's say we have this folder here called BizApp. It's got web analytics and app servers in here. It's kind of like a three-tier web app type of application. Uh, what I can do is I can go in and individually select or what I can do is use this feature called auto protect, which is this shield with the A. If I click on that at this folder level or whatever level I do that at, it's going to, as you can see, select everything that's under that folder. And you can do this at the host level, data center level, what have you. Uh, I can also click on it to disable a, so I want to automatically do it, but this is a test server, so I don't want to back this up, so I could click on it. But what this is going to do is it will automatically back up every single VM in this folder that I've auto protected. And then in the future, let's say you add additional web or app servers because the workload has increased. As you add additional VMs to this folder, it will automatically pick them up and protect them by default. So I'm gonna go ahead and click save. I'm gonna call it BizApp for the protection group. I'm gonna select the appropriate policy that's appropriate for whatever we need. I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna do gold here. One of the ones that's already created. 
And then down here, you're going to see where we have some additional settings. You can create an end date, QoS policy. You can do exclusions on for specifically for uh, working with VMware and vCenter. You can exclude disks on the VM. You can do other things such as cloud migration. You can set up alerts on failures only or for everything. You can set up the priority. You can do pre and post scripts. You can set an SLA time period. Now, one thing to mention on the SLA time period is that this you can have a protection job that completes successfully, backup is done, but it fails the SLA. That just means that it did not complete the job in the allotted amount of time that you have set here. So that is a protection job. So we're going to click protect. So now we've created that job. And as you can see, it has started to go already. So now at this point, uh, I showed you to do a protection job. I'm going to show you how to do a recovery real quick. So we're going to recover a VM. And I'm going to say I want to recover the sent OS VM. So you can use wildcards in here. But when I type it in here, because of the Google search capabilities that we have, because when we back something up, we index everything. So here's the protection job that that sent OS is in, this virtual protection job. But then here's the individual VM. So I'm going to go ahead and select this to recover. I'm going to click Continue. I can select the appropriate snapshot. So if I wanted this particular date and time snapshot, I can click Save. I can recover it back to the original location, to a new location. I'm going to do it to the to the original location, but I'm going to name this and I'm going to say, and I'm going to precursor it and I'm going to call it recovered. I can keep the original networking options. I'm going to do it unconnected to the network and I'm going to say leave the VM powered off. I'm going to leave the network interface as auto select and I'm going to click finish. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to recovery to go back. As you can see, it's in the process of doing that right now. But if I go to my vCenter, where I'm recovering it to, you're going to see that the VM is actually technically already recovered. But what the job is still working on right now is when we do a recovery, it recovers the VM onto the Cohesity platform first, gets it up and running if you chose to do that. And then after that, it will do a storage vMotion back to the original uh, data store for VMware that it was on. So as you can see, it is relocating that virtual mean back to the restore. But actually, if you did a restore and I selected to have this powered on, this would already be up and running at this point in time. So let's go back to the interface. And just real quick, we can also act as a NAS. So here under views, we can create a view. I could create an SMB view to where you can ask, access via SMB. So I'm going to call this SMB only. I'm going to select the SMB protocol because, again, we can present NFS, SMB, and S3 protocols. Best practice is to do one at a time. You can see there's some, you can set it to be case sensitive. There's a lot of different uh, settings here for security, for SMB, for file sharing, for antivirus, and stuff like that. I'm just going to go with the default. I'm going to click Create View, and I'm going to go to Views. So I just created this SMB only view, which is basically a share. I'm going to go over here and I can copy the path. And again, uh, this is SMB. So I'm just going to open Windows Explorer and I'm going to copy that path into here. As you can see, I can now access that. Now keep in mind, I created this without setting any NTFS or share permissions or anything like that to make this quick and easy for the demo. But obviously when you do this, you'd want to set up permissions appropriately in regards to Active Directory and your role-based access and your whatever your policy is for share or file level permissions that you use in your environment. We also have test dev. Test dev is essentially cloning. So I can do a clone of a VM or a database. I'm going to do that sent OS again real quick, and I'm going to clone it. So I'm going to select sent OS. Now I'm just going to leave the latest snapshot. I want to clone that one. I want to rename that to clone. I'm going to leave it powered off. What I need to do, the difference between a recovery and a clone is this. From a clone, I need to go in here, select the source, which is vCenter, the resource pool, the VM folder I want it in, and the particular view. And then I'm going to click Finish, and it's going to start doing that.
So I click back, it's going to start running. If we go back over to vCenter, you're going to see that we have clone dash sent OS already there and it's already done. Now the difference between a recovery and a clone is that a recovery again recovers it to our platform then does a storage vMotion in a VMware environment back to the original data store. However, a clone only brings it up on our platform and then once it brings it up on our platform it stays there. But here's a nice little cleanup feature for your developers and I'm going to go ahead and refresh the screen here just so it shows that it is successful. Whether it be for patching or maybe for developers or DBAs because you can also clone databases. You can see it's once it says successful I can go here and say tear down. I say yes, tear down, go back to vCenter, and we're going to see that clone VM has now been removed automatically for us. Just real quick, we have the marketplace. If you click on all apps, it's going to take you out to our, our marketplace. Again, we run our file system as containerized items, so we can run apps and services on our platform via containers. We have third-party apps as well as Cohesity. The Cohesity ones that have the Cohesity name are free. The other third-party ones like Splunk, Sentinel-1, you will have to bring your licenses for those. Then we have System, which has you know basic information like performance, storage alerts, diagnostic, audit logs, as well as reporting. We'll see that we have a ton of pre-configured reports already done for you that you can use and which you can also schedule these to run the reports and then email them to you or your boss, for example. So that's just a real quick 101 overview of the Cohesity 6.4.1 interface. So hopefully this was a quick overview uh, just to get you started on our interface. Thank you and have a wonderful day.